Well, thank you, Suzanne, for having me back after 13 years. It's been a remarkable 2022. And again, I want to thank you, your board of directors, all of your members for making this such a memorable year for me. We've enjoyed having the tours of the senior communities um, throughout this year. And I know, I know for a fact that we have helped improve people's lives by giving them the options and opportunity to learn about the different senior communities that are all around San Diego County. So I can't thank you enough for giving me the honor and the privilege to, to do that. So I, th I thank you. Uh, again, this is Senior Real Estate Specialty. We are going to talk today about home safety tips. And I'm going to start before I get into the nitty gritty of this is I can tell you coming out of the last two and a half, almost three years of a lot of isolationist, isolationism, I guess that's the right word. I cannot emphasize enough for those people who are listening to this video or know somebody or watching this video and listening to me, know somebody who needs our support. Uh, we have we've seen way too many uh, cases where people are isolated, their, they, their health has been declining, and they're not living safely and sanely in their own home after many years of living there. And we can do things to help them. There are people that they can bring into their home to help solve some of these problems and relieve some of the stress that people are living under who are too isolated today. And it doesn't matter, we just don't know what tomorrow brings. I'm going to be a very personal story here, and I will share with you a family member we just placed at 66 years of age into secure memory care at, believe it or not, Belmont Village right there in La Jolla, which we had the luncheon way back when. They just opened up in August. So at 66 years of age, we just don't know what tomorrow brings. We all hope we're going to age uh, to 100 and live great and be able to do all the wonderful things we want to do up until whenever. But the, Kate, the vast majority of us are going to need help as we age. And that's what this is really all about, is to encourage you to talk about this with your loved ones, whether it's a spouse, your children, your closest friends. Have a aging in place party and talk about things people have doing to help them age uh, properly and safely. So seniors stay or go is morphing into what we call smart sizing. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Real estate options, aging in place, right sizing. What can you do to right size your home to allow you to live comfortably there for many more years to come? That's what part of what we'll be talking about. Or does it make sense? What are your options? Selling a home today can be uh, burdensome uh, because for, for, from a tax standpoint, it can be burdensome. And just the, the trials and tribulations of doing that can be an overwhelming task. So if we're really trying to hunker down in the home that you love for many more years to come. What can we do today? What can we do six months from now? What can we do a year from now to allow you to age safely in place? Senior communities, we've had an incredible year of taking tours of many, many senior communities around San Diego County. I understand that this topic is all about home safety tips to age in place, but while you're aging in place, I highly, highly encourage you to go out and visit all the newness that the senior communities offer uh, for those people that have, are on this, watching this or listening to this, and they went on a tour. I ask that you to share with your friends and family members what you got out of that, what you learned from that, good, bad, or indifferent, and what you see in your future in terms of senior community living. It's changing very rapidly. There's been a lot of new construction in San Diego County for senior communities, and it's what you get from them is really different than what you did five, 10 years ago. And then home share. We probably don't that's not something we're going to talk about today. No secret here, most common experience by seniors who live independently. 
Fall's number one issue is we have to do whatever we can to prevent or to reduce the risk of falling in your home. And once you fall and there's a hip or whatever it may, I mean, brain, um, brain injuries are unbelievably more frequent than you think in terms of falling, hitting your head, not something we want, we want to avoid at all costs. So what can we do in the house to minimize that risk? And what are you doing to think before you climb the ladder? Do you really need to reach that plate up on the very top shelf? I mean, you may be doing, an, you may be entertaining guests and you want to put out your fine china. It's, it's very high up in the, in the cabinets because you only get it out for special occasions. All I'm asking is stop and think is there an easier way for me to get that? Do I really need to get it? Or can I get someone else to go and get that plate, that dish, that silverware that's hiding way up on a shelf or something like that? House fires, bed sores, infections, burns, lacerations, sprains. These are all things that would stop you from having to live independently. And what happens is, yes, you are great today, and there's a bell curve to everything, right? Some of us are going to do great up until we're 100 years of age. More and more people are living to 100. More and more people are driving and doing great things in their 90s. But the bell curve says after 75, 80-ish, there's usually a change in what we are willing and able to do comfortably. Again, the bell curve, not for everybody, some before, some after. So just think about safety issues as you go through your day and what we can do to prevent them. So here we are, uh, the falls. Uh, you can see, grab the, the balance bars, the seat in the shower or the bat, the seat in the shower curbs. These are all little things that we can think about in terms of putting into our home that would stop a fall from happening. Obviously, on the left-hand side, we don't want that. Do you have an Apple Watch? And we're going to talk about the Apple Watch. What do you have in your on your person, in your home, that will notify somebody in case you fall? What is the immediate response? How can we get immediate response out? I know a lot of people don't want to put cameras in their home, but maybe that is an alternative that would be appropriate for you so that your loved ones can see from time, can check in on you from time to time. An Apple Watch, and we'll talk about that. Curbs, balance bars, seats in the shower. And you can see on the bottom, we talk about loose area rugs. If I can ask you to do any one thing as you're listening to me or watching me, I ask you to remove those loose area rugs. Uh, what kind of slippers do you have? What kind of shoes are you wearing during the day? As you know, you can just be a slip and then a twist of the knee and all of a sudden you have a pulled kneecap and now you're unable to walk properly. Lack of accessibility of seating in the bathroom. Uh, how easy is it for you to get up at night? Uh, when I started this with UCSD, I was not a senior. 13 years later, I am a senior and on Medicare. Thank you all. Uh, and I do get up a couple of times during the night. If you maybe too much information for some of you, but I'm getting up a couple of times during the night. And I want easy access to the bathroom. I want, I mean, I even think about not yet I don't need it, but at some point in time, as when I get on an airplane and the and the, and the, the, the flight attendant is you know showing me the lights that go down the center aisle that light up in case anything were to happen, think about that. Think about some strategic lighting as you get up at night from your bed to the bathroom that would go on automatically strategically as you take steps towards that bathroom so that you can see something pretty simple. And that one thing, loose or two things, loose area rugs, lighting to the bathroom at night 
may prevent you from having to leave your home. Simple fix costs you almost next to nothing. Lack of balance bars, unsafe thresholds, including cracks and poisonous materials. And we're going to the next slide. Donating items, stuff in the home. This is a story I have to share with you. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet, to do a presentation on this very topic on right sizing at a senior community in La Mesa uh, about six, seven months ago. And they wanted to bring in people that live in their home and they wanted to talk about right sizing. And in the audience was a woman who actually lived in the community listening to my presentation thinking, why is she here? Other than she's just looking for something to do at the community, but she's already in the community, sort of right-sized into the community. After my chat, uh, after my talk on right-sizing, she called me over and said, you know, Mr. Greenwald, Ron, I need your help. I fell, and this is, so this is the beginning of 2022. She fell and March of 2020, and we all know what March of 2020 was like. She went into skilled nursing and the doctor said, you are not allowed to go home. She had no spouse, no children. She has a sister in, in a sister not in California. And so she moved to the senior community and never, never sought help to do anything about her home, the house that she lived in for 30 plus years. The story concludes very fast forward is that we were able to get in that home and we literally had to knock the door down, the front door down to be able to access the home because there was so much stuff in the home packed in. I assume I will make the assumption that everybody on this Zoom has, does not have that problem. They are doing okay, but you may know somebody. This woman happened to be a college professor, not UCSD, but another college here in San Diego. Very brilliant, very bright woman, very scholarly, but her mind had started to slip prior to the fall and the home just became a very big nightmare for her. And now that she has moved on, to get rid of all the stuff. So I share that story to reiterate, to, to really hone in on the issue of what to do with all your stuff to allow you to age in place safely and sanely. As this picture denotes, there's just too much stuff that creates fire hazards, fall hazards, tripping hazards, all sorts of things. So I ask you to think about, in an upbeat, positive approach to decluttering. There are people, there are companies, there are services, there are outreach programs. Somebody in Suzanne's circle of all the people that she knows that are help, uh, preferred providers at UCSD that can help you start the decluttering process because the decluttering process will take you on that journey to helping that home be safe and sane as you age in place. Don't look at it in the overall arching every room, look at it from drawer to drawer, look at it from room to room. And I just highly encourage you to start having the decluttering parties, have your family members come over, have your children come over, your cousins, your nephews, your aunts, your uncles, whatever it is, come on over, start taking stuff. If they don't want it, if they don't want it, if your family members don't want it and you haven't used it or don't need it, let's find a way to get rid of it. There are consignment stores. Obviously there's charity donations. Again, charities have become much more picky over the last couple of years. They won't take a lot of, of your stuff anymore. Whether you wanna put it on consignment, whether you wanna to try to sell it, if you wanna to try to sell stuff, Maybe that's something for a grandson or a granddaughter because they are so adept at eBay and up five or upper, whatever those, all those websites and all of those apps are 
where you can, they can make, you know, give them the enjoyment of making a little money on your behalf, where you say, here, granddaughter, grandson, here, 15, 20 items. I'll give you 20% of whatever you sell them for, or 50%, of, give them all the money, have the way they can earn, earn some bucks. So make it something that is enjoyable for the family, and you'll get a lot of enjoyment out of it, seeing things either being given to your family members that they want, or making money off of things that you don't use anymore, you don't want anymore, and that they don't want. So think about that as a way to start the process. And that also brings people into your home, family members into your home. If you're one of those that say, I don't want anybody in my house because it's too much stuff, or you you think it's dirty, you know, it's not it's not clean, and whatever it is. There are this way, think about having people come into your home because this way things will, the ball will start rolling in terms of helping declutter the home. I can't emphasize this one enough because this is where we, we get into problems. So specific home safety tips. More and more, there are large uh, contractors like uh, you know, and uh, there's Jackson Remodeling, there's Merrick, Mer I can't think of it, Merrick Howell, something like that. There are large contractors and small contractors here in San Diego and throughout the country that get a specific licensing under their contractor's license for aging in place remodeling. It's universal design. It's thinking about how to make the home safe and sane. And just like anything else, if you go online, if you're going to Google that, certainly you can always call Ron Greenwald for referrals on any of this. There, are, you know, that's our world. Is a database of people that can help you start this process. There are people that specifically work with seniors from a decluttering standpoint, from a remodeling standpoint, from just. From putting the plan onto paper standpoint, it doesn't have to be a lawyer to write up a plan for aging in place. That's more, the lawyer is the trust, right? This is more of a written diagram for you to help you have accountability to help you age in place. So check for licenses, ask around for recommendations, look at the portfolio, and again, that universal design construction. What can you do to make sure that you are living in an environment that is easily something that you can live in for the next five to 10 to 15, 15 years? That's really what your mindset is. Some, some of the ideas that we can capture is clear defined pathways. As we know, we live in, you know, in San Diego, you may live on a canyon, you may live in a, a, a condominium complex, uh, wherever it is, there's, there's lots of ups. It's not a, we're not living in a flat area for sure in San Diego County. Most of it is very uh, elevated and many different, and that's what makes San Diego so wonderful, views and canyons and ocean views and things like that. But what is it from your driveway into your home, from your walkway, from when you get out of the car into your house, what, how level is it? How easy is it? Are there any steps whatsoever? A lot of the homes may have that one, three or four inch step up from the walk pathway to the front door. It's just a slight elevation of three or four inches walk up. What can you do to highlight that? Again, do you have lights? When you walk up at night, do you have lights that come on automatically to shine a light on that little step? Do you have cur? I mean, when you, uh, are you parking on outside of your home and don't have a drive and don't have a garage? What ease of access do you have into the home? If you are in a, if you park in the garage and you have a step up into your, into the house, what lights again are coming on the minute you step out of that car, the minute you want to walk towards that door to allow lights to come on to show you that pathway and to really almost put a, uh, an alarm out to you. I'm not asking for an alarm, but actually highlight that. Large house numbers. That is all about 
if for God forbid you have to call 911 or you have some type of an emergency, yes, we have GPS. Yes, we, you know, the, we hope that they know where they're going, but it, whatever we can do to help them find that home, especially at night, uh, it would be very helpful. Lever style entry handles. Starting to have arthritis, have a lever versus a handle makes it much easier. Solar energy, uh, we, that's a whole different discussion for a different day in terms of how to handle solar energy and be very careful what company you deal with, be very careful whether it's a purchase, are they putting a lien on your home? Are you doing a lease agreement? What is the buyout discussion for another day? But great cost savings, highly recommend that you think about it, but under what circumstances, under what type of contract are you doing that? If you think you're gonna sell that home within the next five to 10 years, really understand your contract. Just like if you're moving into a senior community, really understand your contract. <clears throat> First floor, floating cabinets, uh, the, the high toilet and the bidet, can't speak enough highly about the higher toilets. If you haven't done that, again, what did I say? First thing to do is lights, remove the area rugs, toilet, probably number one, actually. I'll move that ahead uh, uh, in terms of anything else. Handle style faucets, ventilation. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Get that off. Where's that coming from? So, Ventilation, a lot of us, and we've talked about this in the past, we have, we bought a home that had a window, an op a window up and over the sh shower tub. And you step over into the tub, open the window, and on a slippery floor, a slippery surface that is your bathtub. So again, not the best idea. Is that something that how do we prevent, how do we work around that? If you need the ventilation in there, what can we do to have some more of an automatic opening or a handle that you can reach and, and, and open the um, window through a handle of some sort that you don't have to step into the bathtub to open a window. Balance bars, no step showers, these things are so one of the other always questions that we get, well, doesn't that impact the resale value of my home? 20 years ago, even maybe 15 years ago, maybe. Today, absolutely not. Guess what's happening? 70 million, 70 million baby boomers approaching 80. First set gonna approach 80. What you do to your home is going to make a huge difference in the resale value, possibly upwards, if you have an aging in place safe home, because your buyer pool is increasing dramatically for, for this type of product. Technolo <clears throat> technology. So much is going on with all of this issue. Uh, the, the, Apple Watch, we can detect if you fall, uh, Alexa, automatic lighting, automatic motion detectors, uh, cameras, anything that prevents you from having to reach high, reach low, climb over, anything that can eliminate any of those things. And don't think that you're gonna, well, I'm giving up my, I'm giving up my, independence by relying on technology to do things. And that's, that's the opposite of reality, to be honest with you. The op what you're really doing is you are gaining independence. You are gaining control by allowing technology. And I know technology is a mixed bag of, of tricks these days in terms of in, uh, interference in your life. But if you use it to benefit your day-to-day -day existence, to benefit your ability to get out and get on a bicycle and go for a bike ride, to go for a walk, to go and get in the car and drive, to stay in your home, uh, as opposed to having to sell your home, then it's well worth it. Again, online, you can find all of these products and services. We have, we, we have referrals to people that specialize in technology, for aging in place seniors. It's getting them out to your home, 
picking and choosing the mass array of products that would be suitable for you and what you're comfortable with. Making the building work hard, making your home work hard. Motorized blinds, insulated windows, door assist mechanisms. We've talked a little bit about that. One of the things that always I go into homes way too often is smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and fire extinguishers either aren't working or aren't in place. Simple fix, a couple hundred bucks. You should have a smoke detector in every bathroom. You should have carbon monoxide, certainly on the first floor and the second floor near the garages. Make sure they're working. Make sure that someone is out there testing those on a regular basis. Door assist mechanism, we're talking about levers again, insulated windows, keep hot out, cool in. I mean, we've been in a very hot and humid, muggy couple of weeks here in San Diego. Um, should you air condition your home? Uh, as opposed to you opening up all of these windows that are very high, are they convenient for you to open versus putting on a uh, an air conditioning unit that may be a low energy air conditioning unit or dual air conditioning units as opposed to a single air condition where you're spending most of the time downstairs, what would it cost for you to put a dual air conditioning unit in to really, okay, I spend most of my time on this level. This is where I need the cool air to be. So I'm not going up and down, up and down all the time, or I'm not having to open windows that are not easy for me to get to. So let's use that technology to allow you to age in place by thinking about where do I spend most of my time? Can I just focus in on that area from a cool perspective, coolness perspective, given the weather that we have? I love this slide. This slide, this is an indoor elevator that you can put into any two-story, well, I shouldn't say any, you can put into many two-story homes today. So you can see how this works. So the picture on, I guess would be your left. So it goes up, you literally a hole in the floor between the two floors, and this elevator goes up and down, and it is wheelchair accessible. And you can install that in your home and something that would allow you to go up and down very easily as opposed to the chair. If you don't want to do the chair lift in your home, this is something as an alternative. And they are, um, there's a couple companies here in San Diego that do it. If you're looking for a bid on it, just as something that you would be of interest to you. I mean, a lot of people in San Diego live in tri-level homes. I don't know if this worked for tri-level, but if we can eliminate a couple sets of stairs, this may be well worth it to you. Or even a dumbwaiter. If the dumbwaiter in your home, in terms of you're bringing in groceries from the garage and you have to climb stairs to get to the kitchen, how easy is it for you to get those heavy groceries to the kitchen and unpack them? And where are you unpacking them? Can we adjust the cabinets so that everything is eye level or below where you're putting your groceries and you're going in for day-to-day -day activities. But this is a cool, this is a very cool product that I think is gonna do well. Some places for you to go and go into great detail, room by room, item by item, AARP, Home Fit Guide, it's, uh, we can send it to you via an email. It's like a 30, 40 page document. Uh, as I say, you're happy to email it to you out and uh, instead of printing it out and mailing it to you, if you wanna just save it online, read it. It literally goes idea by idea, room by room. And if you just take one idea away from all this, that may help. And then again, like anything else, wow, this really did make a change in my, attitude in the way I live in my home. And then you'll start to go, well, let's try something else. If it's a, if it's a hus husband and wife, a lot of times there's resistance from one spouse or the other spouse going, no, I'm still 39 years old and I don't need any of this, what Ron's talking about. So you can't go in, as I say, guns blazing to make all of these changes at one time and say, hey, spouse, we are 
bringing in the contractor, we're redoing our home. And uh, if you like it, you know, you, you have to like what I'm doing. Maybe some compromise chat, maybe some baby steps to try some ideas. And if that spouse all of a sudden becomes comfortable with what you've done, then you take on the next step. If you are a, if, if people listening to me are the daughter or son of aging folks, and that there's that, again, general conflict between parent and child as the terms of all of a sudden the parent has become, I mean, the child has become the parent and that parent is resisting because they are fear of losing independence and control and pride, then again, I cannot reiterate enough the idea of either bringing in a third party expert in this area and treat your parents with the respect and dignity they, they always deserve from all of us to try baby steps to get them to age and play safely. If, if you know somebody who is resisting and reluctant to change, maybe again, we start off very minutely with a couple of ideas to get them comfortable with you or somebody, an expert coming into the house. This is a, a fall awareness prevention guide put out by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. I can, again, happy to email this to you, email Ron for full guide, a step-by-step -step guide also for risks, how to reduce the risk, what are the high risks, and it also has a room-by-room, -room, just like the AARP has for more of a remodeling perspective, this has a similar concept from a fall prevention perspective. Uh, I would email it out to you. I would have you share it as many people as you can and really help guide people to utilize these, these services and products. Caregiving and home care assistance. Who will be your caregiver while you age in place? This again has to do with what are you willing and allow people to do. I know I've heard it a if I haven't heard it once, I've heard it a million times, Ron, I don't need any help. I can manage it all myself. I'm good to go. That's not always the case. As you age, there is nothing inappropriate or wrong or giving up control or giving up your self-esteem by having someone come into the home a couple hours a day to start with to help you through whether it's cooking or bathing or cleaning, whatever you want them to do to just to kind of help you work on that day. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's for a spouse. The number one thing I will get on this slide is if you think, if you are becoming a caregiver on behalf of a loved one, that is a thankless task that never I, say, I should never say never, that usually does not end well. If you're a husband and wife of 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and all of a sudden your role changes from spouse to caregiver, that spouse receiving the care 99 times out of 100 resents the new relationship that you have creating. And that's with the power of bringing a third party caregiver and to be that person who's helping manage that your loved one through this. I cannot emphasize enough, or will I say it enough times to say, you want to be with your spouse who needs this care, enjoy and in, in the time that you can be with that person. Maybe it's Alzheimer's, maybe it's onset of dementia, maybe it's in just old age and they just can't manage like they used to, but they still have that mindset of what life used to be like with you, your the spouse, and they want to live that way. And so the, being the caregiver removes that ability to be a husband and wife, loved one. Caregiving a third party quality caregiver can bring that relationship back together to the way it was when you got married, raised children, and aged gracefully as being a loved one being the caregiver, the caregiver can be that one doing 
the grunt work, so to speak, or the work that is very taxing. I, I get on that high horse. Reverse mortgage, how to pay for all of this. Reverse mortgages. Um, they definitely have changed the thinking on reverse mortgages in many degrees. I am I a fan of them? I am not a fan of them. It all depends. As long as everybody is talking and working through the specifics of this, the reverse mortgage can get in with the increased valuations of month of valuations of homes today over the last three years. Certainly, this is a way to take money out of the increased equity in your home and use it for whatever purposes you want. You do not lose the owner. You are entitled to the property. You own the property. You have to maintain the property taxes, homeowners insurance, HOA if applicable. You still have to do all that, but you can pull money out, use it for home care, home improvements, a trip around the world, whatever it is. Just understand how it works and make sure your children understand how it works. I don't really care about your children in the sense of if you want to do it, just do it. But don't surprise them you know, 20 years from now that your equity in your home has been um, somewhat used by obtaining a reverse mortgage because it's compounding interest. You're not making a payment on the loan, but it compounds. So what if you took out $300,000 today, it may be five, six hundred thousand dollars of debt 10, 12 years from now. We don't know where interest rates are going to go. It all depends on interest rates. How much you can take out will depend on your age. It's like a life insurance policy, the way it works. The older that you are, obviously, the less life expectancy that you have, the more money you can pull out. If you think you're going to do something over the next and you're going to sell in the next one or two or three years, probably not the greatest product because it is expensive to obtain the loans. Most of that money is not out of pocket. It's added to the loan balance when you take the loan out. Happy to talk in depth about that. I want to make sure I got respect time here. Financial awareness. Nothing is done in a vacuum. And why that's why you really want the team, the team, the team, the team, to make sure you're covering all your bases. Who's on that team is the journey is the your should be your family first, your loved ones first, and then obviously the estate planning attorney, a CPA or tax advisor. If you have a wealth manager, uh, who's guiding you financially is just as important, is more important than ever, given that your home just went from. You bought it for $200,000 or $50,000 back in the 60s, and now it's worth well over a million, two million, three million dollars. Who knows? But there are issues about that. Capital gains. If it's a husband and wife, you can exclude, if you sell your personal residence prior to a death of a spouse, you are entitled to $500,000 reduction in the in, in the gain, I mean, reduce the, in the terms of the gain. So if you sell it for 2 million, you bought it for 500,000. In theory, that's 1.5 million in gain. The law today says you can reduce that 1.5 to 1 million, but that's still a big chunk of change. And then you can reduce it by all the capital improvements you made to the home over the years. And I do not anticipate that everybody has perfect records for the home that they've owned for 30, 40 years in terms of all the capital improvements you made, the remodeling, the painting, the lawn, the landscape, the hardscape, whatever it is. So you do need a, a tax advisor to guide you through that. You can be pretty lenient with that because they really don't want to audit these things. Prop 19, uh, which was passed 2020, you really did a number on a lot of people who want to gift their homes to their children after they pass away. So unless your child is going to live in your home after you pass away, the idea of them being able to maintain your property tax basis after you pass away has pretty much gone away under Prop 19 unless they plan to live there and they have to prove that they're living there. 
Plus, it's not a direct carryover of your property tax basis. It's a hybrid model. So really, if you have rental properties that you uh, believe you want are going to pass down to your children, they need to be aware that the reassessment will come when they inherit these homes from a property tax standpoint. So be aware of that. Step up in basis. We hear about this. If you've owned your home a long, long, long time, yeah, obviously it's worth many hundreds of thousands, if not millions or more than you paid for it. If you, when you pass away or a spouse passes away and you have proper titling to the estate, to the property, to the real estate, it's in the name of your trust, the Mr. and Mrs. Jones family trust, and a Mr. Jones passes away, you're gonna get what they call a step up in basis to current market value, which means you can sell the home very there near after and eliminate all capital gains. So again, this is a hard one to say, but if you have someone whose longevity is less than a couple of years, you may wanna hang on to that home from a tax standpoint to avoid having to pay capital gains taxes. I know that's a morbid discussion, but it's a frank discussion that we can have. So recommendations, I'm gonna go through these. Give away treasures now. We kind of talked about that a little bit when we talked about um, uh, decluttering. I, I get so much joy when you know, my kids come over and they go, oh, you know, I really remember that dad when I was a kid, I'd like to have that in my apartment or my house or whatever the case may be, rather than waiting until I pass and then, you know, it's a free for all and to whom gets what. So if you have treasures that you don't want, you don't need to look at every day, you don't want every day in your home from a design standpoint or whatever the reason, who does want your treasures? And if they don't, who would benefit from your treasures? And think about it as a treasure hunt to give things away and to, from the decluttering standpoint. And a min I'm not saying you have to be a minimalist. I'm just saying, think about enjoyment of things going to other people who, who really would enjoy having that figurine or that bicycle or whatever the case may be. Medical advocacy. Part of the team that I want everybody to consider is what they call an aging life specialist. And I think Rebecca Montoya, I remember that, right? I think that is on the uh, UCSD preferred list. Uh, she is what they call an aging, I think she's speaking soon, aging life specialist. We have advocates for many of the things we do. We have a car mechanic, we have a dentist, we have a doctor. We have uh, maybe a CPA. We have all of these people that we think are our advocates and ask and reminding us what to do. But do we have a true medical advocate? And that's what an aging life special is, specialist is. When you go to the doctor, when you have medical procedures done, who is there to maybe question? The doctors, if you have three or four specialists that you're seeing, are they all communicating with one another? Are they all prescribing different medications? And what are the interactions of those medications? And this has a lot to do with being able to age in place. If your medications are making you loopy, if your medications making you look like you have dementia, which can happen, if, if the medications is making you look like you have a urinary tract infection, which can happen, then things are going to fall. Then think people are going to think you can't stay at home. And it could all just be because you have too many medications or your medical interact, your medication interaction is causing you to fall. It's causing you not to think clearly. It's causing you to, you probably shouldn't be driving. So who who is your kids should not be your medical advocates unless they're doctors. <laughs> Let me make very clear. Unless your son or daughter or grandson or grand whatever is a doctor who can really be your advocate or a, or a, a, a nurse, uh, that's different. But most of us don't have that. 
So who is that person that can help you guide that decision making as to procedurally, you're going to have a hip replacement, you're going to have a knee replacement, who is there to advocate for you when you come home, as opposed to caregiving is one thing, medical advocacy is another thing, two very different train tracks. Caregiving can be there to help you cook and clean and uh, things like that. A medical advocate is going to be there for you to oversee that the caregiver is doing the appropriate thing. Financial decisions. Most people always think that they don't have enough money. So again, a financial analyst could do a cash flow projection as to the cost of living in your home, your life expectancy. Uh, what would it cost to redo a roof? What would it cost to redo your home? Maybe make the downstairs a master. Not a bad idea if the configuration of the home can do it. From a resale standpoint, downstairs masters, single story living is a huge boom from a resale standpoint if it can be configured correctly. So understand your financial situation. Yearly home maintenance. Where we talked about this in the past, it's not so much a yearly home maintenance, it's a yearly home checkup. Just again, I go back to the car every 3,000 miles, the, the rotating of the tires, the, the lube and oil. What are you doing to make sure that you, your small problems don't become big problems in your home? If you have a, just a pinpoint of a leak somewhere underneath a faucet, and what is that creating for you in terms of long-term problems? We want to discover small problems, you know, like, you know, my mom, my mom used to say small children, small problems, grown children, big problems. Same thing comes with a home. If we can capture issues today, why they're small and fix them accordingly, it may prevent a large issue down the road when you go to either sell the home or just when you're trying to live in that home, then you don't have to move out for a long period of time because there's a flood or mold or other issues like that. So you can have a home inspection done once a year, once every two years for four to five, $600 and understand, I'm not asking you to fix everything that comes with a home inspection because it's about a 70 page report, but be aware that these are issues that may impact your ability to stay in that home down the road. And then we get the right contractors in there to fix anything. Comfortable with professional assistance. Get, your independence is really dependent on you accepting the right people into your life so that you can stay independent and control. From your estate plan all the way down, your, that is really with a starting point your estate plan, even though we all think about the estate plan as being something that uh, happens at the point of when we pass away, your life and estate plan is, should be encapsulated with your, when you're talking with Heidi Klimple or Ryan Hislop, whatever it is, so that it's all known to everybody what your wishes are. And the odds, professional assistance, the odds is that at some point in time, you will become incapacitated it could be for a day, five days, or a couple of years. We don't know. So when you become incapacitated, do you have the right professionals around you? So I'm going to 